hear I that I'm listening to music and from a house from the rizq he has given me, from food, from the energy that he has provided for me. I disobey him using that which he's given me. Imam said to him, do not worry, your forgiveness has been uh, uh, granted. And that's why he earned the title, Bishr al-Hafi. In Arabic, if you're not wearing shoes when you walk out somewhere, if you're barefooted, you're called Hafi. Bishr al-Hafi is one of the highest saints in Sufism. Because, you know, Sufism today is very cool, you agree? Like, if you want to be very cool Muslim, you know, like, you know, modern or whatever they call these new Muslim intellectual and things like this. So you're called, you're called Sufi, yes? It's something cool, as in like, you know, you can't blame Ahl Sunnah for it because it's anything away from craziness. And for the Shia, it's a hip-hop way of showing, you know, that you're very modern. This Sufism amongst their highest group is what? Amongst the highest group of the Sufis is the group which follows Bishr al-Hafi. Yet Bishr al-Hafi changed because of Imam Musa ibn Ja'far. Imam Musa ibn Ja'far was the cause of Bishr al-Hafi's change. Therefore, in those years as an Imam, you found Imam Musa ibn Ja'far. He had restrained his anger. The people loved him. The people wanted to be around him. People changed because of him. Until what happened? Until Mansur al-Dawaniqi passed away. When Mansur passed away, who overtook him? After Mansur al-Dawaniqi, who replaced him? Hadi al-Abbasi. Then Mahdi al-Abbasi. Then Harun al-Rashid. These three amongst them gave torture to al-Muhammad like you will never ever see again between them. As in Hadi al-Abbasi, the crimes he committed against the Shia were amongst the most severe crimes ever committed. Hadi al-Abbasi used to make the Shia come and sign their names every day in his palace, near his palace, so he keeps an eye on each one of them. As in, if you woke up in the morning, you have to go and sign your name. So he knows how many of you are around, how many of you are existing. And that's why what you had was that a lot of the Shia at that time had to perform taqiyya. They had to dissimulate their faith. If they came out openly as Shia, openly in those days, you want to come out as Shia, beheading was a norm. Hadi al-Abbasi was uh, looking for the wasiyah of his father. His father has written his wasiyah, I've left for your treasure box, please look after it. He went to the treasure box, he opened it, he saw 60 heads of the sons of Imam al-Sadiq. The great grandsons of Rasulullah, the brothers of Imam al-Baqir, Imam al-Sadiq, Imam al Abidin. These great grandsons that had remained behind, 60 of them, their heads were in a treasure box left behind. <coughs> this Hadi al-Abbasi was the man who committed one of the greatest crimes against the Shia. You know what this Hadi al-Abbasi did? He committed a crime known as the incident of Fakh. We have the famous lies of Da'b bin Ali al-Khuzai, that there are graves in Kufa and graves in Medina and graves in Fakh. Fakh, that area between Iraq and Iran, you find that that area of Fakh, what do we see in the narrations? What does it state? That in that area of Fakh, the great grandsons of Imam al Hassan. Never neglect the grandsons of Imam al Hassan. We sometimes only focus on the grandsons of Imam al Hussein. Imam al Hassan's Sadat grandsons who survived because of Hassan al Muthanna, the, the, the son of Imam al Hassan who survived Karbala. That particular line of sons, they were massacred by Al Hadi al Abbasi. They, mass they massacred them. You know how they massacred them? That it was led, it was a movement known as the movement of Fakh, led by Hussein bin Ali. His sister Zainab was part of those who survived the movement. When Hadi al-Abbasi caught all of these children, they were all relatives of Imam al-Kadhim and Imam al-Sadiq. When he caught them, he said, so you are all the grandsons of Ali ibn Abi Talib and you're all the granddaughters? They said, yes. You the four-year-old, you the seven-year-old, who's your great-grandfather? They'd say, our great-grandfather is Ali ibn Abi Talib. All of you are proud that these are your grandparents, Ali and Fatima? Say, yes, we are proud. 232 of them beheaded in his palace. 232. That Imam al-Rada says, the worst incident after Karbala is the incident of Fakh. Imam al-Rada. The worst incident after the incident of Karbala. To befall our Shia was the incident of Fakh where they beheaded the followers of Al-Muhammad, the grandchildren of Fatima al zahra 232 of them. And they went to Imam al kadhim You know, when they went to Imam al kadhim they said to him, you're the one who's to blame behind this revolution of Fakh. Imam al kadhim looked at them, he said, I have done nothing for this revolution. I'm not any, a supporter of this revolution. 
They said to him, no, you're the one. At that moment, Imam al-Kadhim said, do not worry. If you blame me, you blame me. But the person who's accusing me in a moment of days, he's going to pass away. In a matter of days, that person passed away. So you had the Shia were either being executed in the time of al kadhim or they had to live in Taqiyya. You couldn't say you were Shia. As in today, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Alhamdulillah, we say Alhamdulillah a thousand times that we have been granted the ziyarah of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Isn't it? Isn't that the greatest honor in life? The ziyarah of Abu Abdullah. There's no honor like the ziyarah of Abu Abdullah. Yet, you know, those Shia, they couldn't come out openly to come for the ziyarah of Abu Abdullah. These Shia used to work in the market stalls. They would sell butter. They'd sit down there, they'd sell butter. When they're selling the butter, if another Shia comes to them, Salaamu Alaikum, Alaikum Salaam. How are you? Can you tell me about this mas'al of fiqh for my wife? So what is it? He said, my wife is going through these issues. What's the fiqh mas'ala? He said to him, this is the fiqh mas'ala. Be careful, be careful. Someone's coming. So he says to him, what do you mean? He said, be careful. When that person walks past, he said, and yes, the butter, three kilograms will cost this much for you. Taqiyya. I dissimulate my faith. I can't speak openly about being Shia. They find out I'm a Shia. They'll end up doing what to me? They'll end up killing me and harassing me. So what you had in that time is even Ali bin Yaqteen, Prime Minister of Harun al-Rashid, who was a Shia. Ali bin Yaqteen, the Prime Minister of Harun al-Rashid, you know what he did? He wrote a letter to Imam al-Kadhim. He said to him, oh Imam, I am one of your Shia. Can you direct me please as to the exact way we are to perform the wudu? Imam al-Kadhim wrote back to him. He said to him, oh Ali, you perform the wudu in the following way. You wash your face and you wash your hands and you wipe your head. And you wash your feet. I ask all of you here in this hall, do we wash our feet or we wipe them in the school of Adil Bayt? We wipe them, we don't wash our feet. When Ali bin Yaqdin read this, wash your feet. What does he mean, wash my feet? I'm not meant to wash my feet. Harun Rashid had a prison guard who came to him and said, Listen, this Ali bin Yaqdin, your prime minister, I guarantee you he's one of the Shia of Musa ibn Jafar. And you know we hate the Shia of Musa ibn Jafar. Why don't we dismiss him? Harun Rashid said, Ali bin Yaqteen will never be a Musa, a Musa ibn Ja'far lover or follower. There is no way. He said to him, I promise you, I've seen the man help some of the followers of Musa ibn Ja'far when he walks out in the streets of Baghdad. At this moment, Harun Rashid said, okay, very well. Tomorrow at Salah time, there's only one way to test him. Let's go outside his room. We'll look through the window at his wudu. If he rubs his feet, then what? Then he's a Shia Musa ibn Ja'far, I'll execute him. And if he washes his feet, then look, he's still one of us. The narrations mention that that next day, Ali bin Yaqteen is thinking, shall I wash, shall I rub? Shall I wash, shall I rub? Imam Musa ibn Ja'far said to me, wash. But I'm sure the Quran indicates rub. But Imam Musa ibn Ja'far would never contradict the Quran. And these people are spying at him from the window. While they're spying, they're saying, let's watch now, let's watch now. He's coming towards his feet. And he decides, if Musa ibn Ja'far says wash, then you have to wash. So he washed his feet and Harun al-Rashid turned around to his people and said, I told you this is still one of my Shia. This is still one of my followers, not the followers of Musa ibn Ja'far. These people at Bukhun Taqiyya, you have Bahlul, Bahlul, many of his stories of Taqiyya, where he has to dissimulate his faith, can't come out openly as a Shia. There were people who'd leave countries, you know Imam Musa ibn Ja'far, how many children he had? 19 sons, 18 daughters. 37 children Imam Musa ibn Ja'far had. 37 children of these daughters, you know, some of them ended up dying in Azerbaijan. Some of them ended up dying in Qom. May Allah bless the soul of Bibi Maqsuma. Those of you who have performed the ziyarah of that great lady in Qom. May Allah give you a chance to perform the ziyarah, those of you who haven't. You go to Maqsuma Qom. Why do you think Maqsuma Qom was there? You think she wants to be away from her father? No daughter wants to be away from her father. But these daughters lived in a time of oppression. Many of them didn't get married, not because there weren't people to get married to. The poverty had affected people. Taqiyya meant many of the people couldn't come and propose. There were daughters of Imam Musa ibn Ja'far who went to live in Azerbaijan because you'll be tortured if you stayed living at that time by Harun Rashid. So what you had was the Shia had underground movements. These underground movements would look after the Khums collection. It would be spread underground. It would be called a movement known as the Wikala or the Tanzim al sarri which was the underground movement of Imam al-Kadhim. Many of them were able to approach him until Harun al-Rashid came into the Caliphate. And when Harun al-Rashid came into the Caliphate, he decided that enough was enough. Musa ibn Ja'far has been given too much freedom. 
when Harun al-Rashid came into the caliphate, he decided he's going to move Imam Musa ibn Ja'far into the prisons. And do you know who led to Imam Musa ibn Ja'far being in prison? His nephew, the son of his brother Ismail. Imam al-Sadiq had a number of sons. Of them he had Musa and Ismail. You see our Ismaili brethren in the world today, they follow the line of Ismail. Ismail had a son called Ali. Would you believe Imam Musa ibn Ja'far his nephew was the cause of his years in prison. A so-called Sayyid from the Sadat of Al Muhammad. Because this nephew, you know what happened with him? Imam saw him one day, Yahya al-Barmaki, the Barmaki family. Yahya had said to the nephew, whose name was Ali bin Ismail. He said to him, listen Ali, if you come to Harun Rashid and you make a rumor that Musa ibn Ja'far is gathering weapons and arms to fight Harun Rashid, we'll give you a huge reward. A huge reward like you've never seen. He said, you will? He said, yes. You will never see an envelope like this. Imam saw Ali bin Ismail. He said to him, my nephew, where are you heading? He said, oh, I'm just going away. I have some debts to settle. Imam said, my nephew, I'll settle your debts for you. Why are you going to someone else? He looked at him. He said, no, no, I need to sort out a problem. I don't think, you know, you can help me. Imam said, very well. Here's 300 dinar. Ali bin Ismail looked at him, he said to him, my uncle, is there any advice you want to give me before I leave? He said, don't be the cause of the death of me and my children. He looked at him and then he left. At this moment, Imam Musa ibn Ja'far, he looked at one of his companions. His companion said, Imam, you know your nephew. Why help him when you know he's going to do what you do? the narrations mention that he said, uh, he said to him, that's my nephew still. And this is a lesson for us in life. Some of us, our family haven't even wronged us, really. And we stop helping them financially in every way. Maybe, you know, maybe you had an uncle who gave you a rude look, or an auntie who made a joke she shouldn't have, or a grandma who never contacts you, but it doesn't mean you stop helping them. Imam al kabul knows this nephew of mine is going to cause my neck to be severed. But at the end of the day, this is my nephew, I'll help him. The nephew reached Harun Rashid. Harun Rashid looked at him, he said to him, what's happening over there in Medina? He said to him, you know Musa ibn Ja'far, he's gathering so many weapons in his house, he wants to fight you. Imam Musa ibn Ja'far is gathering weapons, he hasn't gathered one weapon at all. Harun Rashid said to him, very well, well done young man, here is a reward for you telling us this news. The young man, when he felt the envelope, he's thinking this envelope is very light. He opened the envelope, do you know how much he gave him? 200 dinar. How much did Imam Musa ibn Ja'far give him? 300. The nephew got 200. He choked because of how little it was. He ended up dying at that moment. Sometimes in life, we don't know when our death is coming, isn't it? And we want to make sure our final act is an act in reverence of Allah and the Prophet and the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. This nephew of an Imam, nephew, don't ever come and tell me that just because people are surrounded by religion it means they'll be religious. This is a nephew of an Imam of Ahlul Bayt, yet he causes an Imam of Ahlul Bayt to be oppressed. Harun al Rashid began 20 years of torture of Musa ibn Jama. 20 years. There is no Imam of Ahlul Bayt who was physically tortured in prison like Imam Musa ibn Jama. First prison, the prison of Basra. Second prison, the prison of Qantar. Third prison, the prison of Fadl bin Rabi'a. The fourth prison, the prison of Sindhi. In these four prisons, he was away from his family completely. His family, they'd be in Medina, he'd be alone, taken from prison to prison. But I tell you, the manners of the man in prison were the greatest manners. As in Fadl bin Rabi'a tells Ahmed al-Ghazwini, he says to him, Ahmed, come with me to this prison. So Ahmed comes with him. He said, look through the window of the prison, what do you see? Ahmed al-Ghazwini narrates, I saw a piece of white cloth lying on the ground. 
So I looked at him and I said to him, it's a piece of white cloth. He said, no, no, look properly. He said, I looked again, it's a piece of white cloth. 